John chapter 11. Let me find John. As we talked about it last week, John, uh, we're, we're closing in, to me, kind of a sad time. It's, it's a joyous time. You know, what Jesus did for us is, is joyous. And uh, learning about Jesus is a wonderful thing. But for those of us that, we, a lot of us are, uh, let's say, we're, we're sports fans or we are, um, you know, we have our favorite, uh, somebody who's competing in something. Whether that's, uh, you know, uh, sheep showing, I don't know. You know <laughs> I know my granddaughter's sheep showing. But, you know, we have our favorite. We root for them, don't we? We want to see them successful. And we want to, we're excited about that when something bad happens to them. You know, we don't like that at all, right? Well, we're on Jesus' team, ain't we? So when things aren't going, if Team Jesus is not going to have a good time, then we're not going to have a good time. Am I right? So we're getting ready to go through the period of time where you want Jesus to say, hold on now, buddy, you know, right? Ugh. Vanish him, disintegrate him, turn him into stone like they did with, with Lot's wife. Open up the ground like they did with, uh, with uh, uh, what was the guy's name from uh, uh, that uh, they stole the stuff and the ground opened up and the swallowed him up, Achan. You know, I mean, that's what we want to happen to these people, don't we? <laughs> How dare you talk about about my Lord, your Lord too? You just and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. I think he said that for our benefits, not his own. You know, be patient. He says, be patient. One day, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. Be patient. But remember, God is not willing that any should perish. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So, I think we talked about that a little bit last week about his friends and his loving. But we're going to continue on our study today, beginning with verse number 11. As we know, uh, Jesus' friend Lazarus was sick. And his sister sent a message to, to Jesus requesting that he come to heal their brother. And Jesus delays for two days before he departs. You know, his disciples, by the way, they weren't excited about going back. They just left from over there fleeing from somebody trying to kill them. So they were not excited about it. They were excited about staying in their home turf, right, where everybody loved them. And it said many believed on him there. Many believed on him there. They, he wanted to stay in the gravy train. You know, don't we sometimes want to stay in that gravy train where things are going great? Oh, boy. I, you know, I, was, I, was teach, I taught school many years ago, and one thing, it was a motto. Of the, the, one, of my, one of my mentors that had been teaching a while told me, he said, he said David, I got something to let you know. I had a principal that hired me, and then uh, she hired me to go. To, I was at, North, I was at uh, Smithfield Middle School. She hired me at Smithfield Middle School, but she hired me to go to West Johnson High School, but the school hadn't opened yet. So my first year I had to spend at Smithfield Middle School where she was at, but then she left in October. And the guy that she replaced her with was not her. And he tells me, he pulls me aside, he said, David, <clears throat> words of wisdom. If you like the principle you got, be thankful because it won't last. If you don't like the principle you got, be patient because it won't last either. And that set a big tone for me, you know. We want to stay in that thing where it's like what we like. You know, I know, uh, I know many teachers who get hired and they get recruited to the schools, especially career and technical education teachers, because we're special. I mean, it's hard to find them. You've got to find people that's professional in the field making more money than they'll make as a teacher to give that up to come teach school. <laughs> uh, that takes a lot. It takes a lot. Um... But they get recruited by their principal or by their superintendent or somebody recruits them, their CTE director recruits them and promises them all kinds of things. And as long as they're there, they're in the gravy train. But principals don't stay. Administrators don't stay. And next thing you know, your, your, your parent, your adopted parent, wouldn't have had you if they could have. So Jesus here was in this, his disciples was in this land. They were in the gravy train. They were many people believing on him there. 
They didn't have any opposition that was outward at all. People were afraid to be outwardly opposed to Jesus in this territory because many believed on him there. But here comes the two, here comes the messenger from the sisters and saying, Hey, our brother's sick. We need you to come now. And the disciples weren't really excited about it. He tells them that his ministry is almost over, but not yet. Remember, we talked about that. He said, Night is coming, but it's still 12 hours. Is there not 12 hours in the day? Is there not? He said, well, I might be in the 11th hour. We may be at the near end of my ministry, but I still got time to minister. And that's, that's the message to us. It don't matter how old we are. We keep working until Jesus comes or until Jesus comes for me. Isn't that right? We keep working until Jesus comes or Jesus comes to, to get me. Whichever case it is. We're either in the first wave or the second wave. So here we are in verse number 11. These things said he, these things said he, um, and after that he said unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may wake him out of sleep. Now he says these things, these things he just talked about in verse 10 and 11. So we go back and look at verse 10 and 11 because we can't kind of jump in the middle there, right? So verse 10 and 11, he says, uh, find 11, yeah, 10 and 11, he says, um, But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth because there is no light in him. These things said he after that he said unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go and I make awake him out of the sleep. Um, so Jesus got through saying, We got work to do and we got to be about doing it. We can't just stay here until the 12th hour. If there's work we can do, we need to be busy doing it. It may not be comfortable for us to do it, but if we can do it, we need to be busy doing it. So he said uh, that, uh, he said, these things, said he, after that he said unto them, our friend Lazarus sleepeth. So he announces that his disciple Lazarus was sleepeth. Now, the intent was to let them know that Lazarus is dead. Godly men and women, you know, don't die but only their bodies sleep because then until the resurrection or the rapture, we don't die. You understand? The godly do not die. Our bodies die, but our soul never dies. We, uh, we close our eyes in death and open our eyes in the presence of Jesus because Paul said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Instantaneous. There's no such thing as soul sleep. You know, people have this philosophy about soul sleep. That when you die, you go to the grave. Your soul stays in your body in the grave until Jesus comes and resurrects you on the, on the resurrection day. That's not true. We know it's not true. We saw Moses was with Jesus on the transfiguration. And Moses was dead. Why wasn't he asleep? You know? And others. We know the Bible tells us, what about Lazarus? What about the, the poor man Lazarus? was in Abraham's bosom. Abraham was at a bosom. I mean, he want to sleep? There's such a thing as soul sleep. As soon as your eyes close in death, they open in the presence of the Lord. Instantaneous. Instantaneous. There is no such thing as soul sleep. Your body is asleep. Your body is gone. It's a shell. It decays and it's gone. Eventually, it's hard to even find any elements left. That's what's going to be miraculous, don't you think so? I see people cremating people and pouring their body ashes out in the ocean and stuff like that. What's going to happen when God comes back to resurrect? I don't know. It's got to come from somewhere. What if a fish, oh, these what if signs. What if a fish ate some of that and then they got ate by a man and then God comes back? What happens? Whoa! I don't know. I, I can't tell you. But I know the Bible says there's going to be a bodily resurrection. Don't you think so? I can't tell you how. And you know what? Go back again. Johnson County boy, that's a miracle. Because I can't. He says here, his body sleepeth. But I go that I may awake him out of sleep to raise him from the dead. The resurrection of the dead is expressed by awakening. Now, He's not going to, he is not going to resurrect him. He's going to rise him from the dead. And there's a difference. 
those people that died and were brought back to life were not resurrected because resurrection is including the body and the soul reuniting and that thing didn't happen uh, in this case they, he was just they, he brought the body back alive no way that, that Lazarus could have gone into the presence of Jesus during that time period because if he had of there's no way he would have come back what a terrible time that would have been to send him back. Don't you think? If you open your eyes in glory with Jesus and they say, well, Lazarus, I'm sorry, buddy. I got to send you back. See, I think in those situations right that, like that, he had them stay. He didn't bring them with him. Because if, he brought, if, he, if they came with them, he would never want to go back. They were dead. He was dead for a purpose, Right? He was there for a purpose. Um, Psalms 15, 17, 15 says, As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. So see, to be resurrected, you have that new body. Lazarus didn't have no new body. He had an old dead body that he went back into. He did not get resurrected. What happened to him? I don't know. I can't explain. That's a miracle. I can't explain it. I don't, I don't know, know what, what happened, happened to him. I don't know what happened to these others <clears throat> that was resurrected, that was brought back to life at when Jesus was crucified. Remember? The dead came back alive. Well, well where, where were they? <laughs> uh, I don't know the answer to those things. I just know what the Bible says, and I trust what the Bible says. Verse 12. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Well, if he sleep, and let him sleep. Sleep's good for you. I was talking to Jeff last night about, you know, about Gloria, and Jeff said that he had, you know, he got home like at 2 o'clock in the morning, yesterday morning, from the hospital with her, and uh, had gotten some medicine for her and everything, and she couldn't hardly keep anything down. He said, well, she finally got to be, she got, yesterday, they, they were able to give her a little bit of chicken soup and some crackers, and she was holding it down, and she was sleeping. Well, that's a good thing, isn't it? When you're sick, sleep is a good thing. Because you know what, my view, if I'm sick, if I could go to sleep, I'm going to get by this thing faster, isn't it? Because it's just going to take time. Sickness just takes, it's got to work its course, don't it? I'd just soon pass my time asleep <laughs> than awake and going through every minute of it. So uh, it says here that if he sleep, does he do well? The disciples did not understand what Jesus meant by sleep. Most people think of a peaceful sleep, like I said, as a good condition for, for the worst to pass. Seems to have been the meaning of the disciples, and since Lazarus was now sleeping, there was no need for them to take risk. If he's asleep, Lord, let him sleep. There's no need to go up there and take chances. We might die, you know, because Bethany's only two miles from Jerusalem. That means it's a 30-minute walk, and that means those people that tried to kill us are close by. So if he's sleeping, why don't we just, isn't that a good thing? Verse 13. How be it Jesus spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking a rest and sleep. John gives us this comment. It's kind of like a parenthesis, right? John says, hold on. The disciples thought he was talking about sleeping, but Jesus was talking about death, okay? I want you to know, don't, I'm not going to, I'm going to steal the thunder here. I'm not going to wait to think that, that he's talking about sleep. I'm going to tell you right now, he won't talk about sleep. He's talking about death. John knew that Jesus spoke of Lazarus' death, but that, that, that they thought he spoke of him physically sleeping as resting. Remember, John was one of those disciples. So they thought, he said, we thought he was talking about sleep. Verse 14. Then Jesus said unto them plainly, you know, these disciples, they were a dense crowd, were they not? They were a dense crowd. You know, and they, we kind of try to criticize them sometimes, but I don't know if I wouldn't have been dense too. I don't know. But they said, Jesus said to them plainly, Plainly, he says that, that, he, uh, that, they, that, he's, that Lazarus is dead. Jesus said that the disciples just didn't get it. As a result, he told them straightway, Hey, he's not, he's not sleeping like that, boys. He's dead. That's the type of sleep I'm talking about. He's dead. The, uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, Persian version of the, that interpreted Lazarus is dead indeed. 
So their translation was, Lazarus is dead indeed. In other words, he is certainly dead. If he's sleeping, he's not sleeping, boys. He's dead. He is certainly dead. Verse 15. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there. He tells the disciples he's glad that he wasn't there at Bethany before Lazarus died or when he died. I'm glad I wasn't there. See, if Jesus had been there, then Lazarus would not be dead. Is that true? If Jesus had been there, Lazarus would not have been dead because Jesus could have healed him instantly. He would not have been dead. No way would he have, no, no way would they have not because they had faith. The sisters had faith. Lazarus had faith. And for them not to heal him, right? If he had been there, for not to heal him would have been, you know, people, oh, I don't understand at all. Uh, to intent that ye may believe. He said, I'm glad that he wasn't there. You can experience this miracle. If he had been there, you wouldn't have seen the miracle that you're about to see. Believe more, you will believe more strongly that Jesus is the Son of God, the true Messiah. The experience would strengthen their faith in him. If he can raise the dead, but hadn't he raised the dead before? Yes, he had. Nevertheless, they said, nevertheless, let us go with him. So um, he said, I'm glad for your sake to, that, to intent to believe. And then there's a semicolon because now instead of him saying it, the disciples say, nevertheless, let us go into him. Uh, regardless, go to Lazarus, by who by now is certainly in the grave. Verse 16, then said Thomas, that old Thomas is there. Old Thomas Didymus, he's a Didymus. Didymus means he's a twin. Thomas the twin. He said, unto his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Oh, old Thomas, man, he's a crap, isn't he? Uh, that's just his character, isn't it? Doubting Thomas is what he'll go down in history as doubting Thomas. But you know what? He did believe. In the end, he believed. Uh, remember the, the father who had his son who was sick, and Jesus said, if you only believe, anything is possible. So the man said, well, then I believe. But help my unbelief. Thomas needed help in his unbelief. We need help in our unbelief. Because we look around the world and say, they can't be. We can't, I don't understand these things. How can God allow these things to happen? How can God allow these things to happen? Because God has a plan. It's not our plan. And his plan is that the world will destroy itself. We know that. That's his plan. His plan is to allow the world to destroy itself. And when the world has destroyed itself, and he takes his disciples, takes his, 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 uh, um, chosen one's home, his believer's home with him, the world will fall apart. Because remember, we're the salt of the earth. We're the light of the world. You take the light of the world, it's all darkness. They can't do anything right. They can't make any right decisions. I can see that in one party right now. They can't make any right decisions. Can't you? But let's don't be too kind to the other party because they'll talk a talk and not walk to walk. I'm not sure which is worse. The ones that you know are liars or the ones who pretend to be truthful but are still liars? I don't know. The world is going down quickly. Anyway, I digress. He said, um, Psalm Thomas called Didymus. He's a twin, one of the 12 apostles. He takes the stage and moves his, disciples, his fellow disciples to go with Jesus, even if it means that, come on, boys, we got to go with him. <laughs> he said, we got to go, guys, we might as well got to go with him, even if it means death. Let's go with him. If he's going to die, let's go and die with him then. Boy, that's encouraging, isn't it? But you know, he had, he had an emotional appeal to them because they all went, didn't they? Nobody left behind. They all went with him knowing that they probably would die if they went. He said, let us go that we die with him. Thomas is always a half glass, glass half empty type of guy, isn't he? He always was. He thinks he's going to die along with Jesus. His fears were unrealistic in the face of their bitter hostility towards Jesus. We also see his commitment to his willing, his commitment to be willing to do just that. If I have to die, I will die with Jesus. That's a great commitment. So we can criticize Thomas 
But Thomas truly believed that if he went, they were going to die. But Thomas went anyway. That says a lot about Thomas, doesn't it? That says Thomas's faith, I might die in this world, but I got, he's got me. I'm going to do what he asked me to do, even if it means death. That's a strong Christian, isn't it? That's a strong believer. Thomas's words reflect loyal devotion and at the same time pessimism over the fact that they would probably all die. Verse 17. Then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave. So then when Jesus came, he found. When Jesus and his disciples approached the village, they were told by some of the residents as they passed by that Lazarus had died and now was in the grave or tomb for four days. So when they got there, they, somebody as they were getting into town, remember the graves were not in town, they didn't bury people next door because they stunk. They died. Their bodies, de- their bodies decomposed. So they weren't. You know, they part. They put them in a cave somewhere out of town, right? Outside of town, far enough where the breeze wouldn't blow it by on a on a breezy day. So as Jesus was coming towards the town, hadn't got into the town yet. The villagers that were there said, that, "Hey, he's already dead, man. He'd been dead four days." He had been in, laying in the grave. The grave is better, is better understood as the tomb or mean as a stone sepulcher. Uh, in that region of Palestine, it was commonly used for graves or tombs. Either a cave or a rock would be hewed out and the floors inside would be leveled and graded with a shallow descent. You know, it would slowly go down into the grave. A rock was rolled in front of it to prevent wild animals or grave robbers from entering it. He said he was in the grave for four days already. John made a special point that Lazarus had already been in the grave for four days. This is important. This was interesting to me. Four days mean more than just he was there and he's dead and he stinks. Uh, This stressed the magnitude of the miracle. See, the Jews did not embalm people. They sprinkled stuff on top of them, but they didn't put anything in their bodies. Okay, they didn't pump out any blood. You know, the Egyptians would would found a way of pumping some type of of formaldehyde into the body, bombing people today. The Jews didn't; they didn't put anything in the blood like that. They just put stuff over top of the body to keep them stinking, kind of like a, a seize, like a like like doing a, uh, if you had a uh, um, salt uh, salted meat, you know. You don't put it in the refrigerator, you put salt on it to keep it from... Remember, we talked about that. That's why salt was so valuable, and they didn't have refrigerators. So they put some type of seasoning, you know, uh, um, over top of them. So we know that by the fourth day, the body would have been in the state of rapid decomposition. And it would stink. False teaching of the rabbis concerning the newly departed. This was a false teaching that the rabbis had taught people. I, I know it's hard to believe the rabbis would teach, teach something false. false. But, but here it was. They, they taught, taught that when someone dies, their spirit wanders around the sepulchre for three days. Their spirit is hovering inside that tomb there for three days. This is called the days of weeping. The spirit was seeking an opportunity to return to the body. It's going around trying to find a way to get back into that body. And on the fourth day, decomposition sets in and the spirit leaves the cave. You can't, once the body starts decomposing like that, there's no need to go back into the body. It's over. That's why it's important that Lazarus is in the grave for four days. So they couldn't use that thought that three days, well, that was nothing. See, proves what we said. He was just three, four days. After four days, he's dead. So he had to be dead for four days. You see the significance of that? It is important. Did y'all know that? I didn't know that. I figured, I found that out. That's some, and that thought was intriguing. But that makes sense, doesn't it? Why he talks to us about the four days. Um, on the fourth day, the people would assemble. So the three days, they would bury them. And on the fourth day, the people would come and assemble. They'd beat their breasts and they'd loud lamentations for, the four day, for four days, making seven days of mourning. So they began their mourning rituals where they really start weeping and mourning over the person on the fourth day. And they do it on day four, five, six, and seven for four days. But they couldn't do it until the fourth day because the body may come back. And then they're wasting all their mourning. (laughs) 
what's going on with that? <laughs> anyway. Okay, verse 18, 19. Now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs off. And many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. 15 furlongs off means it was about two miles from the golden gates at Jerusalem. So with the golden gates where you enter into main gates of Jerusalem, Bethany was about two miles. Uh, many of the Jews, no doubt, walked from Jerusalem to Bethany to be with Martha and Mary. Apparently, they were a prominent family in Bethany and well-known in Jerusalem. A lot of people came. They came to comfort them, to speak tenderly. It was a custom for formal visitation of friends to last several days. Well, a lot of their stuff lasts several days. The weddings last a week, you know. Um, as soon as the family returned from visiting the grave, the mourners stood in long rows, each speaking a word of comfort while they passed by. We kind of do that today too, don't we? Usually a lot of times the family stands, you know, they, you know, they'll do that. Uh, some places don't. Some people rush the family into the cars and they go to the grave site, you know. Some places have you stand in a line and people go by and say something to you. Or they have you there at the beginning. I mean, they, we, we do it more at the beginning, right? Before you leave, they come by after they, while they're doing the wake and they talk to the people similar like that. They're a long line and they talk to them about their loved ones. They try to sympathize with them a little bit. Um, after the initial greeting, the Mormons in the line, they visited the family at the home to show sympathy. So John chapter 20, John 11 verse 20. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went to meet him. So Martha was the eldest and therefore entrusted with the management of the family. We know Luke 10, 40 talks about that. She probably was the first that heard of Jesus' coming. Um, she went without waiting to inform her sister. She immediately went out to meet him. In John 11, 28, when we get there, she immediately left. So as soon as someone said, hey, Jesus is out of town coming in, she left immediately. She stopped what she was doing. She put her pots down or whatever, and she headed toward Jesus. It said, but Mary sat still in the house. The word still is not in the original, by the way, but it means that she remained sitting in the house. Uh, the common posture of grief in the Jews was to that of sitting. They sat when they were grieving. You can find this in Job 2.8, Ezekiel 8.14, but anyway. Often the person was so grief-stricken that they, re rendered, they were rendered immovable. I've seen people with that much grief, haven't you? Where they can't even talk or move, they just sit. And people come by and try to say a word to them and they don't even respond. They're in such shock. They're just, you know, there's such grief is so tremendous for them. Mary may have been this way. He says she was sitting in the house, but Martha didn't worry about Mary. <laughs> she cut off all down towards Jesus. Verse 21. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou had been here, my brother had not died. Now, some people view this as a rebuke of Jesus, but it was that probably was not the case. What she's doing is making a statement of fact that her belief in him, Lord, if you had been here, I'm sure that he would be alive. Not, Lord, you didn't come, you know, and that, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't rebuke. Why didn't you come, God? Although sometimes we rebuke God, don't we? Sometimes we have that attitude. We may not say it out loud, but in our hearts we say, Why, God? Why did you not do this? Or why did you allow this to happen, don't we? But Mary didn't, I mean, Martha didn't do that here. Martha just simply said, uh, Lord, if you'd been here, if you had been here, Lord, I'm confident that he'd be alive today. I knew if you were here, he'd be alive. That wasn't a rebuke, but a statement of fact, a statement of faith in him. She believed in him. Uh, he didn't be there. I mean, the centurion's servant and the nobleman's son at Capernaum, he didn't have to be there. He proven he could heal from a distance. So why didn't they send the messenger to Jesus and say, Jesus, heal him. He's sick. And Jesus just said, okay, he's healed. Couldn't he? He could have. Well, the problem is, we'll see in a minute, he couldn't. He couldn't have healed him at that point in time. And we'll tell you why in just a minute. <laughs> Verse 22. But I know that even now, Whatsoever thou seek, thou ask of God, God will give it thee. She said, I still got hope. 
I believe whatever you ask of him, he can give you. I know that even now, at this distance of time, though her brother had been in the grave for four days, you know, she'd heard about Jesus healing those who were dead and bringing them back to life, and this was a, there was a glimmer of hope. Lord, I know you've healed these other people and brought them back to life. I know, though, that won't four days, though. I know it won't four days, but Lord, I know you have done miracles. And she said, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Now, not sure if Martha's faith showed her belief in his deity yet because it looks like she's relying upon God the Father's power and not God the Son's power. Right? Whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Instead of whatever, whatsoever you ask of God, it will be done. Your power. You have the power to heal. He had the power. Jesus is God. <laughs> so he didn't need to ask God the Father for anything, did he? She was certain that Jesus had a special relationship with God and whatever he desired of him was granted to him. And Martha did not ask for a favor in direct terms. She never asked God to heal him. She never asked Jesus to raise him from the dead. She never asked. You have not because you ask not. And when you ask, you ask amiss. See, she never asked God to heal him. They sent the messenger to him and said, Lord, he's sick, come. They didn't ask him to heal him. They didn't ask him to raise him from the dead. They just told him what the problems were. Sometimes don't we do that with God? We tell God our problems, but we don't ask him for the solution. God tells us to ask the desires of our hearts. God will give us the desires of our hearts. We need to ask him for stuff. We can't just assume God's waiting us to ask him for something. I'll give it to you if you ask. You didn't ask. You know, if your children want to give you money and they come in and him haul around, but they're going, I'd really love to do this. I'd love to do that. Well, that's good. They don't ever ask for any money. Do you say, you know what? Hold on there. Let me give you some money. What are you waiting for to ask you? Can I have some money? <laughs> I might say to my daughter, you got enough money? Yeah, I think so. Or I can handle it a little more. I said, do you want some then? <laughs> you know, you got to ask me for it. I'm not just going to my wife should give it to her anyway, but I, I try to make her ask. <laughs> um, this is why many prayers today are not answered. Verse 23, Jesus said to her, thy brother shall rise again. Jesus knew what she meant and simply told her that her brother would rise again. Listen, Mary, Martha, your brother is going to rise again. Verse 24, and Martha said, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection in the last day. Martha could not tell whether Jesus' statement was referring to rising now or in general resurrection. She said, well, I'm not sure what you're talking about here. I know he's going to rise in the last day. I know your promises are that. I know... The resurrection promised by Jesus. John 5, 25 through 29 that we've already studied, but I'll remind you, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall near hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and have given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth, and they that have done good unto resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of the damnation. She knew what Jesus had said. She said, I know in the resurrection he's going to rise. This was not all that she desired. Her tone, she hinted that she wanted more than the resurrection of the dead in the final days. She wanted a resurrection now. I know it's going to rise then, Lord, but I, kinda hope, I sure would like you to do it today. But she did not boldly express her desires, did she? She said, Lord, can you just heal him now? Come on, just raise him. Can you just raise him now? Okay? He probably said, sure I can. Stand back and watch. Because he was already planning to do it, wasn't he? He knew he was going to do it when he laid, laid four days. Verse 25. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. She says, I am the resurrection. I am the resurrection. He's the author or the cause of resurrection. Resurrection depends on Jesus' power and his will. Simply put, Jesus is the resurrection itself. Without Jesus, there is no resurrection. 
He is the resurrection. All power in the resurrection comes from Him. I have the power to lay my life down, and if I have the power to lay it down, I have the power to take it up again. See, Jesus had the power. God the Father did not have the power to resurrect. God the Son had the power to resurrect. Now, say, aren't they one in three? It's a miracle. Can't explain it. <laughs> the Holy Spirit lives in us today, not Jesus. The Holy Spirit lives inside of us. The Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin. The Holy Spirit drives us to do what we need to do. The Holy Spirit does that. Not Jesus the Son, not God the Father. The Holy Spirit does that. But they're the same. I can't explain this miracle. Point is, resurrection is Jesus' deal. He has the power. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. The resurrection depends on Him. John 1, 4 says, In Him was life, and the life was the light of man. He that had the power to do it now was well as them. Verse, and then he says, He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Faith does not save from bodily death, does it? Faith does not save you from bodily death. If the Lord tarries, we'll all find our way into that tomb, into that grave. Will we not? All of us. The believer, just like those who were not believed, will die the physical death. Yet they will have eternal life after that. Even if the believer dies, they shall live. See, just because our body dies doesn't mean we die. Our spirit will live on in eternity in the presence of God. And let me tell you, to be in the presence of God is life. And to be absent from the body of Christ, and to be absent from God is death, is darkness. In Him is light. Without Him is darkness. In Him is life. Without Him is death. In Him is heaven and glory. Without Him is hell and damnation. You see, the Christian lives forever. He can't die. His body can die, but his soul can never die. Because he's in the presence of God. Hopefully you're in the presence of God today in your life living in this world. If the Holy Spirit's inside of you, you're living in the presence of God today. This very moment, he's with you. Whosoever lives and believes in Jesus will never die. That is, he will never die an execution death for his sins. He will never be separated from God. You will never pay the price of your sins. Never, because Jesus already paid those prices for our sins. Then Jesus asked the question, Believest thou this? Do you believe this? He said to Martha. 5.24 said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. That's what I'm telling you. When your body stops pumping, the minute it stops, the last heartbeat, the next heartbeat in heaven, bam, ba bam, right? It never ends. Bam, bam. Pain to glory. Bam, bam. Suffering to riches, to, to pleasures. Verse, verse 27. She said unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which shall come into the world. She says, Yea, Lord. This is a noble confession. It showed her full confidence in him as the Messiah. Her full belief that he was what he said he was, and that he was true. She firmly believed, Lord, I know it. I believe it. I have no doubts about it. That's where we're going to end tonight. Because we're going to, next week we're going to get into Mar Mary. <laughs> okay. uh, we're going to end with Martha here. But this is a powerful message of the Scripture. Powerful. And you know what, aren't you glad that John included it? And remember we talked about the reason why the others did not was possibly because at the time they wrote it, he was still alive. And he was well, it was well known of what happened. And he would also be subject to great persecution and people trying to kill him, as we'll see a little later on in the verse that they were doing it. Anyway, let's have a word of prayer and then we'll uh, have our prayer request. Lord, I thank you so much for this opportunity we have that we can come to your house, we can worship you, we can study your word. We thank you, Lord, for the Son, who's the resurrection and the life. We thank you, Lord, that we trust in him, and he gives us eternal life. When our heart stops beating here, our soul keeps beating in heaven. As a Father, by present with the Lord, we thank you, Lord, for that. We thank you so much for all you do for us. Help us, Lord, to share the gospel with others so that others can be snatched out of the pit of hell 
and experience the great, great riches that we all shall. For it's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen.